This is the regular meeting of the Terre Haute City Council. It is oh, almost 6.20, June 14th, 2018. I thank you all for being here. And again, I do apologize. We ran late with our, our special call, so uh, I apologize again for that. Um, we begin each of our meetings with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, Councilman Morris will be leading us in the Pledge. Person Aller. Present. Councilperson Azar. Here. Councilperson Crossan. Present. Councilperson Debon. Here. Councilperson Elliott. Here. Councilperson Garrison. Present. Councilperson Morris. Here. Councilperson Nasser. Present. Councilperson Nason. Here. All are present. Thank you, Michelle. At this time, we offer 30 minutes for public comments on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, the agendas are up here if you would like to get a copy. Uh, please keep your comments to around three minutes if possible, in case we have uh, a number of people who would like to speak. Having said that, if anybody would like to come up and speak, now is the time to do so. And please give your name and address for the record when you come up to the uh, podium. My name is Donald Hyde. I live at 1411 Poplar Street. Last uh, week, I told you what I felt and again, I want to be clear on this. This is my opinion. Each one of us has a right to our own opinion based on our life experiences and what we think. But my opinion right now that the number one problem in this city, county, as far as I'm concerned, the state of Indiana and the nation as a whole, is apathy. I stand by that, but three minutes is hard to talk about such a large uh, subject. That has a lot of importance. So I'm going to help give you more to think about by giving you what I consider the second worst problem that ties with the first. And I'll explain that here. It will take me less than three minutes to do both. Give me something to think about. We have a lot of problems in our county, in our city. And uh, we're constantly reading a newspaper and we're not getting much information out of it because nobody really steps up and addresses the problems, or especially how to fix them. The number two problem, believe it or not, is hope. Now, the reason I mention that as number two is because it is because you have to take what the number one problem is, apathy. The reason hope is the number two problem is because what apathy is. Apathy is doing nothing not going and bothering to vote, not going and bothering to help tackle any problems or finding out any solutions or come up with any answers. Hope, the hope is the opposite of that. See, apathy is not caring. Hope is supposed to be where we care. Now, the reason I say hope is the number two problem isn't that hope is a problem. What the problem is, is the lack of hope. And that, because of the apathy being so bad right now, hope has jumped up to the number two problem. Not because <laughs> hope is bad. Hope is always good. But because the lack of hope across the city, the county, the state, and right now the nation, The difference between apathy and hope is hope requires one thing. Apathy doesn't require. Anybody can be apathetic if you don't want to work. How easy it is to just say, not my problem. And you don't have to work. Not my problem. Whatever the problem is. Not mine. You don't have to work. But if you want hope, hope has one requirement. It has always had one requirement. It remains one requirement, and that is work. If you are not willing to work, 
do not say you have hope. If you're not willing to try and find answers, do not say you have hope or you have an answer. You don't. Work is number one ingredient to any kind of hope you want, no matter what it's about. Without work, there is no hope. So what we have... If you could wrap it up. I'm wrapping it up now. That's why I made this point. What we have is apathy. We don't seem to care about anything. And hope is the second problem because we stop caring. We stop working. I believe that we are better than this as a city and a county. I just came from this church group that organized one of the best things that happened in this city all year long. That's that Strawberry Festival. There's one church put out to work amongst their congregation to put on this Strawberry Festival. They brought families together. They brought people together. And they had something that everybody can enjoy. And in that meeting, the people happy. There was hope. It didn't cost hardly anything other than attendance. But it cost them work. What I want to know is why the city of Terre Haute, one of the best cities as far as I'm concerned in this whole country, a little less the state of Indiana. Why we can't do more of that? Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Hello. My name is Andre Kumar. I'm a resident here of Terre Haute, and I'm pleased to see the mayor here. And I'm, I simply wanted to get confirmation whether or not the council has received the budget numbers from the mayor's office yet or not. And if, if so, I applaud the mayor's office. And if not, I was simply wanting to ask when that might be expected from, from the mayor's office. We do our budget in October. We vote on it, and we, of course, got all that information. But I think what you're referring to is each month we are to receive uh, up-to-date financial okay. information within 30 days of the following month, and we haven't received that since the end of the year. I'm sure the mayor might be able to comment more on that with regards to sub software upgrades, but we haven't had those uh, reports. I don't want the public to think that we passed the budget without financial information. We did have that. So, thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Okay. If not, uh, we'll go ahead and, and move along. Corrections uh, to the journal? There are none. Communication from the mayor? I, I have a few questions, Mayor, if you can. A few minutes, please. Well, I think this would uh, uh, help out. I've had a few inquiries as well as social media has been blowing up about a few instances that have happened at the uh, Dimmy Park pool. I know that's been open for about 12 days, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to put out those fires with regards to uh, uh, young child not being able to swim in the pool with a certain floating device. So I just wanted to see if you could comment on that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, we have uh, had a situation where somebody came to the pool, um, didn't discuss anything with staff, just attempted to put a Walmart purchased floaty into the pool, which are not allowed. They have to be Coast Guard approved flotation devices that are made for specific situations like that. And they didn't have that. And the staff went through the options for them. They could have held the child. They could have used the lift chair that's out there for that purpose or they could have went and purchased, you know, the, per the proper flotation device. And they took that to, and they left the, the, the location. And since that time, we've looked at some options about purchasing some equipment to have on hand out there. We've never needed it ever. I can so ever would, remember. Would you but say the pool is ADA compliant? The pool is ADA compliant, but an individual might come who might have some special needs that have to be accommodated. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. And then the other thing, I wanted to revisit the uh, software um, upgrades. I know we, we have had this conversation a number of 
months with regards to when we'll start be, being able to receive some uh, financial information. And I know mm -hmm. at the last meeting you again emphasized that the staff is working diligently to get those uh, uh, numbers entered so we can get that. Do you have a goal or a timeline when you feel that that would be completed where the city would be able to get, the city council would be able to get the financial information? Well, as I said last week, within two weeks, I hope to get January through March out. Okay. So That's what we're working on right now. So is, so beginning of, uh, by July's uh, first council meeting, do you feel like we'd be able to have January through March? Yes. I hope there are 100 percent accurate and not 99.9 .9 percent accurate okay because I don't want to put anything out to the public that's not what we stand by with the State Board of Accounts well one of the things in, in the person that spoke before at the uh, public comments you know I don't want anybody in the public to think that this council is making any financial decisions with regards to anything uh, with the city finances without having up-to-date information we're getting ready to last week we voted on a redevelopment loan that didn't have we didn't have financial information and then mm -hmm. we're getting ready to do another loan this evening where we're being asked to do stuff with I know you've made some spreadsheets uh, some information but I, I feel like this council uh, needs to be able to have as much accurate and I know that's what you want to do uh, accurate information yeah, but I would disagree that you don't have the financial information needed for the redevelopment loan. That's the same materials we've used for the last two years. There's no report that's going to come out of the system to, to provide um, the data for a specific request like that. All right, so it's not a standard report that comes out of the system. We're always going to have to create those reports. Well, I know those reports shows us uh, revenue that's being generated in those TIF funds and expenses mm -hmm. that are going out with bonds and so forth. And it'd be nice to know if we're you know, accurate and not accurate, but if we're up to date on our bond payments and so forth. And I'm sure you're going to tell us that, that we are, but that information, <laughs> at the end of the day, I want to be able to look my constituents in the eye and say I've made the most accurate decision I can with their interest at heart. And if I don't have financial information, I feel like that's a challenge for me. Well, it may be for you. I mean, I understand, but we give you the information you need to make that particular decision. And even so, if you had... Uh, you know, the financial reports, I mean, we've never missed a bond payment ever since I've been here. Eleven years, we've never missed a bond payment, and we're not going to. And so, you know, it's it, those financial reports may or may not show that to you. You'd have to really look deeply to find those. If you'd like a report that tells us that we made the bond payments, I'd be happy to create a report like that because that's not part of the standard delivery. Well, and I know that, you know, it was said that it's a 200-page report, and and I think it's 197 okay. pages, but it's close. I <laughs> but I, I don't want people to think that that is 200 uh, pages that's being printed for nine different council council persons. That it's a uh, an email report that we get. Uh, I remember at the very beginning of the year, one of the first questions that I asked after I was elected back in 2015, uh, I asked what you felt the city council's role is with financial. Uh, being, with being what our role is in city government and I just wanted to see what your response is to that it's the same it's based on statute not what I think but what based it, on what, statute what well, let me answer the question council thank you um, the city council's role is to approve a budget and then to approve appropriations as related to changes in that budget throughout the year so everything else is on the controller and the mayor okay so our role is to approve loans that are less than five million dollars correct well, any, well, there's a variety of loans. I mean, there are TIF loans. There's going to be a variety of things that you have to do. It's all based on statute. Well, state statute says $5 million. Yes, but so one of the things that, you know, I, I enjoy listening to your Ask the Mayor uh, segment that you do with WTIU, and mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I listened to it, and there was a quote that came out that, came out that I kind of, I had to rewind it and see if I listened to it correctly. You, you said on there, and I quote, it's not the council's job to run the city's finances. That is correct. It is not. Okay. It's the controller by statute okay. and the mayor. Okay. It's just, you know, if you guys want to change the state law, talk to your legislators. Okay. I yield. Thank you. Hey, uh, Councilman Elliott. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment a uh, couple of things. Um, the redevelopment loan, well, that's on the agenda, so I guess I'd we're not supposed to comment on that this time? No. We're done with that. Huh? We're done with that. That was last week. Okay. Well, I'm, then I can comment on that. <laughs> if, if, if that's gone from $5 million to $2 million, then tax flow had to come from somewhere, 
to fund that $3.0 million reduction. We just don't know where, where that is yet because we haven't been told where and we don't have the financials. But sooner or later, when we get the financials, we should be able to see it. If we don't see it, then we, we can ask for an explanation and we will, we will get that. But if that's gone from five to two, to me, that's good news. And, and one other uh, issue that we get involved in from time to time is the, uh, the approval of uh, revenue increases, mm -hmm. which uh, to have revenue increases, then, you know, that, that means we probably ought to be paying some attention to the, to the expenses we're, we're approving because uh, mm -hmm. they kind of go hand in hand with, uh, with one another. So I think there is a little more to it than, uh, than what, uh, as I see it, a little more to it than what, uh, what might be explained. Are you? Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Report, um, reports from city officials. There are none. Uh, Mr. President, on your agenda, there's a note that's incorrectly that should uh, be under number uh, eight. Um, I assume you're referring to what is under number seven? Correct. Okay. Reports from Board of Public Works and Safety. Uh, there are none. Okay. Reports from standing committees. I believe there is one from uh, Councilman yeah, Elliott. Councilman Elliott. Four items that, uh, that I just want to touch base on briefly. Uh, two of them relate to items I saw in the uh, Board of Public Works uh, agenda. The, uh, the first is uh, the city now has an agreement with uh, RGL Solutions for, I presume, advocacy uh, grant writing, uh, and the grant writing, you know, got my attention. I think that's, uh, I think that's great. Uh, it looks like there's uh, uh, contingent, uh, contingent payment arrangements for that. In other words, it's a percentage of the successful amounts that, uh, that are raised from that. And I just, I just want to make sure we're all aware of that and that if we thank our sea of opportunities, I, I don't know what the, protocol or process is going to be if we see something that merits investigation, but uh, I'm sure we can work something out and process and, and we can be told. Uh, the second item is uh, uh, fire department and ISU entered into an agreement to provide services at their, at their, at their ball games. Uh, when I look at the uh, per hour amount, uh, I kind of wonder about that amount. And, how much margin there is between our direct costs of providing that service and, and what we're supposed to get paid. And I, uh, I probably will contact, uh, uh, I think it's Glenn Hall, and uh, ask for a conference and come to an understanding of that. Uh, the third item, uh, you know, uh, State Board of Accounts audit, uh, going concern comments that, uh, that the mayor's made. Uh, I looked into those standards, uh, had one of my staff members look into those standards, and concluded that it just should not be an issue for 2016 because there's a prospective look forward period that's 12 months, maximum of 15, and we're by that, and we're still here, and we're still going. So for 2016, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, for 2017, when I look at one of the at the list of, of issues that might indicate uh, going concern problems, I really just don't see them. Uh, see the applicability of any of them today. Uh, inability to, to meet obligations without substantial disposition of assets outside the ordinary course of operations restructuring of debt, externally forced revisions of operations, or similar similar actions. I mean, I just, I just don't see that. And uh, I may be out on a, on a limb here, and I'm already out on it. If it gets cut down, so be it. But I, I shared those comments with the uh, State Board of Accounts uh, Monday or Tuesday, sometime this week, because I felt it was best to get proactive and get out in front of that issue 
and not let them go down the road and, and think they're going to they're going to issue that uh, when I you know in, in my experience don't think they should. So it'd be a lot easier to to address it and put it in front of them now what uh, what I was thinking and then try to get them to to walk back once they've gone there. I mean, I our firm has issued those opinions from time to time. We're we're familiar with those rules, and uh, and I, and again, I just I just don't see it. I, I told them our 17 numbers would be a lot better than 16 numbers, and when they see the June or the July June 30 balances, those figures come out, they'll they'll see that again, and uh, uh, I just I just did that. Can I comment just briefly, Mr. President? Um, we agree. It's it's appreciated that. Uh, City Council stepping up to assist us with that because sometimes it looks like the administrations just all administrations anybody's talking to the State Board of Accounts they always think you're trying to you know finagle the way they uh, interpret those things because there is different interpretations we agree exactly with what you just said and it's just very comforting and appreciated to know that you're back there supporting us so they're not just hearing it from our side so thank you for doing that okay. and then the other uh, Fourth item I've got to uh, to mention is a is an email that uh, one of my partners received from State Board of Accounts that uh, she forwarded to me. She's the uh, uh, treasurer handles accounting records for a conservancy district here in town. But uh, but going forward, there's a, there's going to be a requirement for the upload of monthly uh, financial uh, reports and bank reconciliations through Gateway to the State Board of Accounts beginning with July uh, 2018 being due by September uh, 15 of 2018 with the ex expectation that everybody will back up to January eventually and upload those those future uh, uh, six months those prior six months of 2018. So uh, there's uh, obviously an expectation on, on their part that those records would be available in 45 days after the, uh, the end of the month. Uh, I do not know if the fact that that's done, if that makes them public records or not, uh, but I will uh, follow up with State Board of Accounts and, uh, and find out. And this is, uh, to me, just, just came out, out of the blue. Uh, it's based on their auditing process. They want that stuff ahead of time so they don't wait till they arrive at your location. You bring them 50 boxes of things. They want it all online ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. It just <coughs> creates a lot more internal work, but it is what it is. Everybody has to play by the same rules. And I think it is everybody. Yep, it's everybody. <laughs> Little, well, big, everybody's got to do it. From what I read, it was all sorts of governmental yep, entities. Yep, across the board. That. So, uh, and that begins when? What, next month? Next with, month. with July reports due September 15, and then uh, of course a couple people in our office are wondering, well, who's going to look at all that? <laughs> but that's that's not our. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess that's not our concern. Uh, with that, uh, I yield. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Uh, reports from non-standing committees. There are none. Items previously tabled. There are none. Tax abatements for confirmation. There are none. Items on second reading. There are none. Items on first reading. Resolution 8, 2018, supporting the necessary action by the Vigo County Council to move forward with the Terre Haute Convention Center as an economic stimulus for Terre Haute slash Vigo County. Petitioner. I'll, I'll go ahead and speak on that. Okay. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm sure all of you have read the emails I've sent you regarding uh, letters that David Patterson had written with the uh, being the executive director of the uh, Convention Visitors Bureau about uh, how much uh, revenue our city generates with um, uh, tourism, which is over $40 million this year alone. Um, I know at the State House they finally have given us uh, an opportunity to uh, implement a food beverage tax that will help with the uh, um, financing and operation costs for the convention center. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that the CIP um, still moved forward even though they weren't able to come up with an agreement with ISU to make it a, a joint venture. Um, 3,400 jobs is what our community uh, entails with uh, tourism. Uh, I know some people think those are minimum wage jobs, but I've been in the tourism uh, industry for quite a long time 
and you try and tell that uh, uh, parent that's doing a second job that, you know, that job's not important or a college student that's trying to work to be able to, you know, pay for her books or her tuition at school. So um, this basically just shows that we're going to be supportive of the um, council when they make that uh, uh, vote uh, probably in July. They're going to be doing uh, uh, public comments uh, period. With that, the CIB has generated a, a website uh, that allows people to go on there and to answer any questions that they might have with regards to, um, you know, if they, we've done any studies to see if we're supportive of a convention center. I do know that other communities are doing it. Uh, Kokomo is in the process of trying to do it. Uh, Bloomington. Um, this, this venture will be a private uh, uh, public partnership. It won't be just all you know, city and county and the CVP doing it, there will be a private developer that will be involved with this as well. So I just ask that we uh, show support with the convention center being downtown. It's going to be used with edit money, uh, our portion from the city. Um, that money, you know, I, I think of any project we've ever done, a convention center is the best use for uh, edit money. I mean, we've used edit money in the past for cash flow purposes, but I think this will help us with what it's meant to do, which is to uh, reinvigorate uh, downtown and uh, make it uh, a destiny for uh, people that live here as well as people that want to have conventions. We, I can tell you a number of times uh, David Patterson has told us uh, as a uh, board how many um, conventions we've had to turn away because we don't have any space for it. So I just ask everyone to uh, support this, and I know Mayor probably has a few comments since he is. Uh, on the CIB board, uh, but I just ask everyone to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak on the resolution 8, 2018? No. Well, no. Yeah. Well, Sorry. You're right. No, go ahead, Michael. Sorry. No, 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 is there, I have a copy here that the uh, CIB put, finally posted to the website of the draft study for discussion only. Was there ever a final study delivered to the CIB in the market feasibility? Uh, the mayor will be able to comment on that since he's on the board. Yeah, which copy, which one do you have? No, that's a different one. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. On both of the pages, it just says for discussion only. So let me show you. Yeah, this is the original one. Yeah, well, it's, 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 I don't know why it says draft copy, but this is the report. We have one report in the first round from 2014. Okay. I don't know why it says draft. Maybe somebody. Well, it's whoever uploaded yeah. it. That's yeah. what okay. That's, that's what um, so the second question is, um, has there been a new study now that we have a new market and new parameters as far as the convention center that's being proposed? <laughs> Are you talking about the fact that it's not going to be a joint project with Homer Center? Um, well, there's a, that's part of it, yes. Okay. Uh, the short answer is yes. Okay. Mary, you want to respond to that? Sure. All right. This is cool. Sorry. This is back and forth. We have not hired, the CIB has not hired somebody to do another study to reflect the Home and Center component not being a part of that. The convention business that's in the study will not change. You know, Home and Center is going to get a few things. Clearly, there's things that fit that. But the convention business that we're turning away is really what drives the convention center. So Home and Center will continue to have some of their events that wouldn't have gone in the convention center where they would have stayed at Home and Center. So you just got to kind of split that out, take them out of the equation. And so we've not done that yet, but we'll, we need to freshen that up at some point here before we make any final decisions. Thank you. Okay, so let me see if I got any more questions. Um, you said the edit, so I know where the money's coming from, the Terre Haute portion. Do you know the amount? Uh, our portion uh, this last year was $250,000. Uh, two years ago, we had allocated uh, $500,000. Uh, our portion will be $10 million when it's all said and done. And then the... Uh, County will be $10 million, and then the Convention Visitors Bureau uh, has put forth $6.5 million commitment. And that's six, and so I read that the um, CDC or whatever it's called, it's CVB, is that actually 
county gave them money or they get it from private sources? No, that is generated from hedge and beds. Uh, that's that's a, I don't know that for is. people that work in the hotel business. Basically, any time we have visitors that stay at any hotel throughout the state and the country, they pay a portion that is a uh, state tax, and then they pay uh, what's called an innkeeper's tax. Our innkeeper's tax right now is 6.5%. So it's still we, be, okay, I, go ahead. And then I was just going to say we use that money to help promote uh, Special Olympics. We, next year will be the 50th anniversary of them being here. That, that generates, if you look, this weekend was packed with visitors to our community. We help with uh, some of the uh, legwork with the uh, Special Olympics as well as we do um, help out with Griffith Bike Park. That has visitors. I don't know if you've been down there, but if you look at the license plate, the majority of those license plates are for people. Uh, out of town. We also help with, uh, there's a drum line that comes here in April that we help uh, attract them to, to come here that fills out our hotel on the weekend in April. So that innkeeper's tax is basically used as a recycling tool for better explanation that we use it to generate other events in the future. Okay, I understood, but so it's still tax receipts. It's tax receipts from people that are coming, staying yeah. at our hotels from out of town. Okay. So then I just, I guess I have a comment about the, as proposed, that I'm just going to read it because I'm not good at absolute. It's actually a comment on your Facebook page. I saw that today. Okay. I didn't get a chance to read it. I apologize. No, don't worry about it. Um, I read the article. It's an opinion piece, short in specifics, or use of data that Karen was speaking about from Mr. Patterson. Uh, there was a preliminary market feasibility study done when ISU was involved. It was a draft for discussion only, and it's available on the CIB website, and the mayor's cleared up there is a final copy. Um, no new study, to my knowledge, has been done. Some parameters have changed significantly as to make the first study unusable and require a new one. Some issues off the top of my head, loss of affiliation with ISU. That was a guaranteed 60 events a year in addition to other benefits. It would compete directly with the Holman Center, as the mayor pointed out. Elimination of several possible sites for locating the center, reduced capacity, less secure funding, and more risk passed on to the taxpayers. There's been no market feasibility stone with the new uh, limitations. To move forward without due diligence is, in my view, reckless and short-sighted. So I would only ask, I know that you guys don't approve the food and beverage tax, I would ask that somehow you amend that to somehow include that you would like more information before you go totally on board with supporting um, them moving forward since they apparently don't have a plan. Then, uh, if you'll indulge me, I have a counter view to opening convention centers in um, cities that are struggling economically. It's written by Michael Hicks, February 4, 2018. For anyone who doesn't know, he's a director and associate professor at the Center of Business and Economic Research at Ball State University. He's also on the board of directors for the Southern Regional um, Development Authority. And I'm going to skip around a little bit if you want a copy. It's available on their website. Um, the painful truth is that 80 or more Indiana counties are in absolute or relative decline. Despite some very real economic success in Indiana, prosperity is unevenly distributed. And this trend shows no sign of diminishing. Any sort of policy considerations of this challenge require understanding two issues that point to a wholly different approach to developing local economies. First, local economic development is not like a business or a government agency where change can be fashioned in a few short years. Population decline is a result of families making deliberate location choices, typically not to move to your county, city, or town. The factors that cause migrations won't easily change over the short run. Second, the current policy efforts, especially local ones, are mostly futile. The sad fact is that most troubled places in Indiana are awash in costly and ineffective economic development, development spending that targets business attraction. Ironically, many of these places, e.g. Muncie, Marion, Terre Haute, and others, actually have far more jobs than they do qualified local workers to fill them. To make matters worse, most business attraction efforts redirect resources away from the very activities that would lower population growth. The increasing concentration of economic activity in just a few urban places is due to the simple desire of households to locate those places. The realization should lead, this realization should lead civic leaders across the Midwest to change their approach. Most places in Indiana should entirely eliminate economic growth as a public policy goal. That's right, most of Indiana's counties, cities, and towns should abandon economic or even population growth as a realistic policy goal. The demographic trend is already set, 
and more than half of Indiana counties will continue to lose population throughout this century. Instead, today's economic development policy ought simply to focus on making it better for the residents, residents who already have chosen to live here. These people need great schools, yet most don't really have them. These residents need safe communities, some sort of recreational activities, and a thrifty and responsible local government. They don't need speculative buildings, fancy marker spaces, I don't know what that is, or tax abatements granted to all new businesses. Those are the policies of the desperate, uninformed, and the unimaginative. This new strategy is not a surrender to inevitable decline. Rather, it is a recognition that growth will someday return to much of Indiana, and the places that enjoy that growth will be the first, will be the ones with the best schools, the cleanest neighborhoods, and the most efficient local governments. Those will be places people wish to live. The places that ignore these fundamentals will remain in decline for decades to come. And uh, so I appreciate you listening to that. Yeah, I just want to make a few comments on that. With regards to competition, competition with Holman Center, as any business owner would tell you, competition is good. I don't see us uh, being a challenge to Holman Center with what they're doing, and I don't see that they're going to be a challenge to what the, the uh, CIB is going to be doing with, with their, their location. Now, I, I can tell you the number of times where I have, and I'm sure other people have gone to other communities and say, you know what, wouldn't this be nice to have in Terre Haute? And then we try to have an opportunity to have something nice in our community, and then we try to figure out every reason in the world not to do it. Me as a city, city leader, I feel like we need to get away from that mindset. Um, I also look at this as an opportunity to the State House to show that, you know what, we are already open for business. We are ready to make our community grow. Um, you know, nobody in a million years thought that they would pass the food and beverage tax for our community, which allow us to be able to do it. And here we're on the cups of doing it, and then we're trying to figure out why it won't work, it can't work, and so forth. With the quality of life aspect, I work at a hotel, and we tell our employees that every person that walks in that door could be the next person that brings jobs to our community. So if we have an opportunity to build a convention center that is going to be one of the most state-of-the-art in the state, we need to, to do that so if people come to our community, they see, wow, they're doing good things in this community. So that's why I'm supportive of it. I, I am appreciative of your, your, your comments, uh, uh, Mike, but a, a lot of times I think when it comes to doing a study, we did a second study on the jail. We, we spent $100,000 on a jail study just for them to come back and basically the same thing. I mean, we could probably do this again with the CIB and have them do another study, but I work in this industry as long as I have. I know that our community will support the convention center. Do I get a retort? Yes, please. Okay. Appreciate what you said and understand it, actually. <laughs> Could be convinced to support it, maybe. My first point was, you said so much out there, i got to pick one thing. Why would you want to move forward with $10 million when it really has changed? And in the report you have here already, there's limited opportunity. That limited opportunity was going to be a one show. Now it's going to be two shows. I would think that anyone here would appreciate a professional opinion instead of anecdotal evidence from a hotel worker. Okay. Well, uh, I'm not finished. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it's okay, it sounded like I was finished. Um, so really, I was making two points. One is, I hope that y'all amend this recommendation to somehow reflect that you would like more information and maybe you still think it's a good deal. I have more power to you. Secondly, I'm glad I got to read into a record I think there's more things important at this community that we need to prioritize. A convention center is not going to benefit most of the people in the Harrison Township. Okay. And I uh, appreciate it. Also, I have a uh, compliment. Keep doing those forums, and um, like I went to the one Martha did, and when you were both, you were both of them, that is really important to the community. They feel like their voices are being heard. And I would have just made one suggestion. I don't even know what it would be, except if you could um, promote it more or advertise it better, because I know a lot of people regretted that it didn't make it. Make it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I just want to say one last thing. Um, the financing portion from the city is still the same, regardless of whether or not it was with uh, ISU or not. It's still going to be the same amount. And 
I, I just think this is uh, going to be a progressive uh, project that's going to show that our state, our city is moving forward. You know, these aren't just minimum wage jobs. We're going to be paying construction workers to build the, uh, the facility as well. So thank you, Mike. Hey, yo. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to speak on Resolution 8, 2018? Yes, I would like to do that. <laughs> I yielded my time to the gentleman. <clears throat> you are welcome, Michael. Just a couple things. First of all, I'd ask for your support on this tonight. Um, all you're doing is just showing the same support that we kind of did in the past. When we testified in front of the committee to get this to happen, it's really important for Terre Haute to be on the map in Indianapolis. You know, other places are getting their pieces of this. Sometimes it's because they have legislators in powerful positions from those communities. In our case, Senator John Ford went to bat for us to get this done and the rest of our delegation. And we need to send the right message back. Of course, we're not going to spend one dime until we know it's a good project. We're still working through this. And so until we get all of the final details and we make that final determination, then we'll be happy to share all of that with you and everybody else. From the CIB perspective, we, had to, we need this piece to help from a variety of components. Yes, we've got $25 million committed, but we need to make sure we've got that operations money and some other funds coming in. When the Holman Center is paid, well, Center, the Holman Center project will happen, our project will happen, we'll both do our thing, and then at some point we will have ours paid off. And then that CIB, the money that will continue to come into the CIB from the food and beverage tax can go to other projects in the community, so that are related to tourism. It's very specific in that, um, in the law. And so our goal will be to do those things that improve the quality of life, quality of place for Terre Haute, um, you know, I appreciate what Michael Hicks has to say. I read all of his stuff. He sends it to IAC, now AIM. He doesn't like TIF districts. He doesn't like, he doesn't really like anything. And so uh, he thinks that you just ought to sit back and wait till a company comes. Well, if we sit back and wait, then we're not going to get anything. It's a very competitive environment out there, and we have no choice but to step up to the plate and make an investment in ourselves, and that's what this is. So I just ask for your support. It would be great if we could get it nine to nothing, but just your support on this would be send a great message both to the State House and to the county. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on Resolution 8, 2018? Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything, but hey, not to the one guy, oh, Donald Hyde again. After the one guy gave his talk, I, I feel obligated to say something. One of the problems Terrell has is we're shrinking. And uh, we're losing too much of what makes Terrell Holt worth living in. Work is what hope is all about. If you put no work out, then why do you expect hope? I'm for um, the visitors thing. I'm for rebuilding till it's brand new and better than it ever was. ISUs. I can't even name it now. Old oh, age is getting to me. Holman Center. Holman Center. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Holman Center. Because I was there when it opened up and so were you. My God, it felt great to go to those places. We were seeing stuff we hadn't seen in this town ever. But the trick is, once you have something like that, the work is keeping it. Now, you might have to change with the time, and I'm not going to argue with that, because it's true. But by God, it doesn't mean you have to just throw the baby out with a bathwater. No. You find a way to keep it going. But with that said, I will agree with the uh, gentleman on one thing. When we first built Holland Center, Holland Center God, my memory is terrible. It's getting worse. <clears throat> Holland Center, there was all kinds of things we never had before. The first two years, we had concerts we never seen before in this town. Not because uh, we were too small. And the concerts were changing. We couldn't keep up with it. You remember back in the 60s and the 70s when I was a kid, when I was a teenager? There were 
groups that are famous that would come to Terre Haute and play a concert. By the 80s, all of a sudden, we weren't big enough. Well, the Hallman Center can only ha uh, have 10,000 people. If we sold all the tickets, why well, this band, whatever band it was, wouldn't come because <laughs> I'm not going to play where there's only 10,000 people. We need to have more people. Well, we've got to think outside the box. We've got to start taking and repairing home and sending. Then we've got to ask ourselves, what can we afford and what can we do? Well, it requires work. But what it doesn't require is saying, well, we tried it and we're going to give up. We're going to go somewhere else. Because the thing about the, the biggest lie in government right now at all levels is whatever they're talking about is the way we need to go. Without us, and that means the people of Vigo County and the city of Terre Haute having any voice in it. We don't ask what everybody's opinion is. And they don't care what our opinion is. Big business wants to have a concert, and it once was that if you can make, if you can invest a few bucks, and you got ten bucks, you walked around and whistling. You were happy. You made money. Then slowly but surely, it became necessary that if you invested ten bucks, well, you had to make a hundred bucks. Then it got to the point where you invested a hundred bucks. Oh, forget about a thousand bucks. No, 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 no. If you invest a hundred bucks, it should be more than that. Look at the sports teams. And the last should get to the point. Uh, uh, the point is this. We, the consumers, we, the people, have to stand up and quit being apathetic and say, hey, you know, we can and we want a visitor center. We can and we want Harmon Center. Because we want to be able to get together in a group and participate in things. That's what makes a city a city. Now, you can have a town or a little village where a little fa couple families get together and that's their village. Or you can have a city that can contract and can do a lot of things and educate the people and make things better. But you got to work at it. And then the start, as far as Thomas Center is concerned, it's basically keeping it going. That's the work. If you want to have a visitor center, fine, build one. And if it takes 10 years, take the damn going 10 years, but get it done. But the thing is this, you've got to be willing to put in the work, and above all, never give up. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on Resolution 8, 2019? Council. President. Councilman Esser. If there's any, no more uh, comments or questions, I move that we approve Resolution 8, 2018. Second. It has been moved by Councilman Esser, seconded by Councilman Morris, that we approve Resolution 8, 2018. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Thank Next you. item, please. <clears throat> Resolution 9, 2018, authorizing a temporary loan from the Terre Haute Sanitary District Operating Fund to the Tana Terre Haute Sanitary District Bond Fund. Petitioner. Mr. President, members of the Council, Mayor Duke Bennett, uh, thank you for having the special call last week to be able to go through a lot of the information related to this resolution. I'm just going to hit on the highlights of it briefly. Um, we have Dean Rogers from Mumble and Associates here and Dennis Otten from Bose McKinney. Uh, our council and to be able to answer questions for you. Um, the bottom line on this really is we're going to change the way we account for things. In the past, since 2013, we've had to transfer money from wastewater fund over to the sanitary district bond fund because of property tax caps. That's all it is. We have one sanitary district bond that's funded by property taxes. It's short every year. We get a disbursement in June. Payments due on July 1st, we get a disbursement in December, 
payments due on January 1st. And so we have to supplement the property tax cap losses by user fee revenues. Only logical place they can come from. So as long as the caps continue to do what they do, we're going to have to do this. This year we faced a situation where because of those transfers in the past, the Department of Local Government Finance treats that as revenue. So they decided this year they were going to look at that and say, oh, you've got revenue, you're good to go, you don't need as many property tax dollars. And so in order for us to restore our levy next year, this action will help us with that. We will make a transfer over of a loan and then our June 30th financial, uh, the data on that particular day that we provide to the Department of Local Government Finance as part of the budgeting process that we do later, um, will show that we're not overfunded. We have liabilities. We have a loan that's out. And so uh, Dean's much more well-versed in this, but I'm just trying to keep it at that very simple level. There's no, the bottom line stays the same on all of this. We're going to spend the exact same amount of money. We just need to do it in the form of a loan and then pay that loan back versus a permanent transfer over uh, that we get penalized as revenue. And so I'd ask for your support on this tonight. It's important that we do it in the month of June in order to have this in place by June 30th of this month, um, to have those funds transferred over, and then they immediately go out on July 1st. They'll all be spent and gone to make that bond payment. So um, be happy to answer any questions, and then we'll have, as I said, Dean and Dennis here both to answer your questions also. Thank you, Mayor. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on Resolution 9, 2018? Good evening, Pat Goodwin, 2215 North 10th Street. <clears throat> there are so many things wrong with what you're being asked to do tonight, I'm not really sure where to start, but I'm going to go through a short list if you don't mind. Uh, the first being, it's June 14th and you're being asked to approve a loan to make a payment on July 1st. Now, this is in a fund that is property tax supported. We can easily predict how much money will come into that fund every year. It is 100% predictable that if we are short, we will know it months ahead of time. And yet, you all are being put in the position now of needing to vote on this this month so that the administration can make a payment on July 1st. There was no need. This could have been brought to you in March. They knew that they were going to need this loan. But now, unfortunately, you don't have time to ask questions to really understand better what's going on. You've got to vote on it. If you step back from what's going on here, you start to see the real absurdity of it all. So this is a loan so that we can pay a loan. The money is coming from the wastewater utility. The wastewater utility two years ago took out a $6 million loan, which has not been paid back. What was the $6 million loan for? Well, half of it was to put into an escrow account to make sure that they would make the payment on the $150 million wastewater treatment plant loan. So that's where we're taking the money from, the place that we had to already borrow money to pay on another loan that we couldn't come up with the money to pay on. In addition, you're doing a $3.8 million loan this month. Last month, you paid down the redevelopment loan, $3 million. I've got an idea of where the $3 million came from. The next thing is that the bond fund, the sanitary district bond fund, is pooled with the city general fund. Now, the mayor stood up here last week and said something that made it sound like it wasn't, but he confused you with his words. And in fact, the same thing happened to me the previous Tuesday at the sanitary board meeting when I asked Dennis Otten, are the san is the sanitary district bond fund pooled with the city general fund? He said, no, the wastewater utility funds are not pooled with the, bond with the city general fund. And I said, wait a minute. No, I'm asking about the sanitary district bond fund. And then he said clearly, without any ambiguity, yes, they are. So be careful when you ask one question that you're not getting an answer to a different question. I'd like to show you something here. This is a report that the city put out about a year ago. 
And I'm assuming that Umball wrote this report. Is that right, Dean? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a report. Annual information for compliance with SEC Rule 15C2-12. I couldn't tell you what that is, but it's something that the city had to put out. I'm going to read a couple bits of this for you. Regarding the pooling of cash accounts. The city pools most non-construction cash accounts. This includes cash related to other city funds, including the sanitary district, which cash balances include bond-related funds and accounts such as debt service reserve funds. Goes on, says a few other things, and then later it says, in June 2015, the city filed a voluntary disclosure saying that the city had taken steps to segregate the debt service and debt service reserve funds of the sanitary district from the pooled cash accounts. However, the city has been unable to take such steps successfully, and the debt service and debt service reserve funds of the city have continued to be included in pooled bank accounts and the subject of interfund loans. Now, that was summer of last year. There's no date on this report, but I can tell the, the context of the other things that they're talking about here from early in 2017. So we continue to play the shell game. And it comes back down to the pooling of funds and using cash that's supposed to be for one thing for something else. So the next thing that's really kind of amazing uh, is that you've not been provided any financials, and yet you're being asked to make a huge financial decision tonight. In fact, as far as I know, you haven't even been told whether the sanitary district has gotten that distribution yet or not. Has the sanitary district gotten that distribution yet? However, I'm, I think we have a fairly good idea of exactly how much that distribution will be, probably within $100,000 or so. So we know how much is going to go into this account, and it may not be enough to make the full $3.8 million payment, but it certainly ought to be enough to pay most of it. As the mayor stated last week, property tax caps on this fund were about 28%. You can do the math. Maybe it came up a million dollars short. So why wouldn't we just take out a loan for a million dollars? Why do we need 3.8? Most of the money should be in that account. So in closing, I don't know what you should do tonight because you can't default on bond payments. That's not a good thing. We're already in a situation where our bond rating is junk bond status. But I will say this. You're about to go into the budget cycle. It's time for the shell game to stop. You've got to put a stop to the shell game. The taxpayers deserve it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on resolution 9 yeah. 2018? <clears throat> for clarification for myself and Donald Hyde, but I also want to clarify for everybody on television the entire county and city of Terre Haute, all the people. You have not went very far, and I'm talking about the city council and the mayor combined, explaining exactly what we're paying for. And we've been paying for it for the last five to six years. This storm water thing. You haven't, des you haven't described what we're getting for our money. Why we're paying it. Why we're being billed for this every month and it's going up now you're saying we need more money we got why what are they doing with the money where what is being built and where are they at the building and when is it going to be done i think them are fair questions that the average voter the average citizen the average taxpayer in the city the county heck the state would like to have an answer to I don't know why you don't want the answer to that question. So I, my question to you, and I want to hear an answer to it. What are we spending this money for? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on Resolution 9, 2018? 
Council. Councilman Nasser. I have a few questions. Um, I know we had discussed that DLGF had made these changes. When were these changes uh, told to the administration? In February. Okay. But what it's important to note that it's just over because 18 is over. We're talking about what we're going to do for 19. Okay. So if we were told in February, mm -hmm. why are we now just being told about in June when the bond payment is due in July? Well, Dean and Dennis can expect negotiating for three months, or last three months with the state SRF and with the state, or excuse me, Department of Local Government Finance to develop a solution to this. This is their true solution to this issue we face. Well, in a sanitary district that's underfunded by property tax caps. I know you had said that all other communities are doing this, so why would we have to have a special conversation with SRF and DLGF? If every other community is doing it, why would we have to have a special <laughs> conversation? Right. And maybe this can answer that from a legal perspective. Why they changed this year, I don't know. But that's where the so the conversations are going on now. Those things are happening now. And then they didn't happen in the past because they interpreted that transfer of funds over as if they didn't treat it as revenue. They did this year. And if we didn't uh, vote on this loan. Would we default on the bond payment or do we still make the bond payment? Absolutely not. And it's very misleading for anybody to stand up here and make a statement like that. It's simply untrue. We would transfer the funds over, just like we have done since 2013, to cover the difference. We don't find out what our tax estimate's going to be until February. We get our 1782 notice, that's when we find out. You're going to put the budget together and approve it in October this year. We'll find out next February how much we're going to get next year. Okay. That's when we find that out. And then the last question to follow up, uh, why the full $3.4 million? Why not just what we're short? That's the max, and that's what we decided to do is put max in there. That's the whole payment. We won't need to do that much. We'll do what we need to do. Well, to, to give the uh, rate payers a little peace of mind, why would we do the full amount just because? We don't, we'll only do what we're going to need. When we get our disbursement, know exactly what the disbursement is. Maybe people don't pay their taxes. You know, we'll see what the disbursement is. So and we'll have to make up the difference. So if it's 28%, why wouldn't we just do 50%? Why are we doing the full 100%? No, we'll still? do whatever we need for the rest of the payment, just like we would have trans we would only transfer over what we need for the payment. Okay. So we'll only loan over what we need for the payment. Okay. I but that money, the payments are always made. They're not in jeopardy at all. If you don't act on this tonight, the payment's going to be made. Okay. Well, we're going to do what will hurt ourselves is for next year, we're going to penalize ourselves with $3 million worth of property tax dollars next year. Thank you. Mr. President, Councilman Garrison, a few questions. I know we talked to, or there was some discussion about tax disbursement for June. Mayor, do you know, have we, have we received that yet, or have we done an early tax disbursement? We got an early tax disbursement, but I do not believe any sanitary district, because we didn't ask for that. We don't, because we don't need the money till June 30th. What is the, what was the early tax disbursement? Yeah, boy, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it's, a, it's broken out into about eight different categories, and I'm not, I don't remember what the total was right now. But uh, those funds are all separated from this. And let's, can I just answer a question? I just thought of something. The pooled funds, it's just kind of funny how people want to play the games with that. We're not playing any games with it. We're explaining it very clearly. There's no money in the sanitary bond fund until we get a disbursement in June. There's nothing in there. And then the disbursement comes, and then two or three days later, we make the bond payment, and it goes back to nothing. Then we do it again in December. So if there's nothing that can be pooled because there's no money to be pooled. Okay, so let me ask you this. You don't know the total. Uh, I, I could get that. I apologize. I just can't remember. But Every year it's different. You said they're separate accounts. So when we do get our tax disbursement, a portion of that goes directly into that bond fund. Well, we don't get an early disbursement on the bond fund. We'll get it all at once, and it will all go in the bond fund. And how do you get that? Do you have all of it now for the first? No, I don't think we got our first disbursement. Unless it came in in the last couple of days and I've not been informed, I don't believe we've received it yet. It usually comes at the end of June, by have, the end of June. Have we, prior to this, have we been putting whatever is supposed to go into that bond fund each time we get our tax disbursement? Oh, all of it. I mean, because there's not enough to cover, and so it all goes in there. 
And do we ever take that money out for anything other than what it's intended for? No, absolutely not. Um, it's just it's property tax dollars that go to the sanitary district bond fund. Well, there was some conversation about money being pooled. I guess my next question would be, are we holding that money and then taking it out and making the payment when it's due? Well, technically, it's pooled for a couple of days because it goes into our bank account where we receive all of our revenues that come in, and then we separate them. So those come in, we set up the bank, the electronic transfer to the bank, and so they kind of sit there for a day or two, depending on what day of the week the last day of the month is and the first. So if the bond payment's due on a Saturday, then it may sit there Thursday and Friday. If the bond payment's on Monday, maybe it'll sit there Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I mean, it's only there for just a very short period of time. As soon as we get it, it goes out two or three days later, immediately out the door for a bond payment. There's nothing in that fund that just sits there. All right, let's talk about the levy for a little bit. I think the way this was presented last week, I think um, all did a good job of... Uh, coming up with this solution. Sounds like, I think we just heard that you guys have done this for other communities, figured out this way. Um, I'm not sure how it worked. We're, at the same time this month, we're, we're, we're talking about reducing our redevelopment amount, three million, and then, I don't know if this is coincidence or not, but now we're talking about $3.8 million coming mm -hmm. from another source and shifting over. Totally unrelated. Have anything to do with no that? connection whatsoever. None, zero, zilch, nada. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's just a wild accusation for somebody to make that. I'm not saying you, Councilman Garrison. Sure. The bond fund has nothing in it, and we're going to have something in it in a few days, and then we're going to make a payment on the first, and then we'll have nothing in it again. And so if we have to make up the difference. We've got to make that bond payment, so we have to pull the revenues in from wastewater to make up the difference. Period. Well, I, I and I don't that. like this. I mean, I, as soon as they brought this idea to me, I thought, oh, great. You know, we got, let's, let's go talk about this from the perspective of having to come to the council every six months to do this. But we're going to have to do this until what year, Dean? Have you, you think, we think we'll be able to pay it back. It may be indefinitely. We don't know. Yeah, so maybe the next 20 years we're going to have to come to the council twice a year just to do this paper process to make the DLGF happy in order for us to get our maximum levy. We're, we're playing with their system. We're working within their system. I wish we didn't have to do this. Because we've got the money to make the payment. I, we can keep doing what we're doing, but we're going to keep losing more money. And then you're going to have to raise sewer rates. No, we don't want to do that. Absolutely not. No, we don't want to do that. Nope. Nope. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe this is the best way, um, but I'm I'm concerned this first go around. I know this sounds like we're going to be doing this every six months, mm -hmm. um, but the first one makes me nervous. Just not having the numbers in place, not knowing if, if and how much tax disbursement we have, if we've got it early. We didn't um, get it early, though. I just I mean, don't know, I know what it's going to be. I know you guys have been working on this for three months, but we're just hearing this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a stickler, or I want to be a stickler for the money that comes in and it goes to the allotted place. Redevelopment money should get their money. <clears throat> We've been borrowing that, so I've already bending a rule there. Edit money should go into edit and use for economic development. Well, we know the laws have changed, and now we're using it for other things. Um, so I get that. Um, and so now we're getting, not now, we typically get bond payment money should go into that account. And it will. You say that it, it happens. You say that it will. It will. Um, for about three days. And then we spend it. It's hard for me to, to keep up with the where all the money is going. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I, I'll do it for now. Well, and I appreciate that. But keep in mind that the State Board of Accounts, <laughs> they, they dig deep. And so if there was one thing that went to the wrong place and, and it was against statute, we would be flagged for it. I guarantee you. Especially we've had lots of um, not friends of the administration who make calls over there all the time and do a lot of things to make wild accusations and ask questions that raise their antenna. And so we get public scrutinized as much as anybody in the state, and I'm good with that. But thanks for your – I understand so what there, you're saying. The, oh, the State Board of Accounts, when will they review what we're doing here tonight? It's well, hopefully it'll be a little year, faster right? than what they've done in the past. So right it's now they're doing 16 and 17. It's usually a couple of years before they go back and look at what we're doing, right? It, it's supposed to be a year. But once again, we've been doing this same thing now 
for years, and this audit, the 1617 audit, are going to show no issues in this area at all, I guarantee you. Do they know that we're doing this change and this will reflect on the levy and keeping it where it is? Uh, just the DLGF, not the State Board of Accounts, I don't so believe. Do you, I mean, you guys, either one of you suspect this will be an issue or you think they're going to no. be fine with what we're doing? No, I wouldn't think the State Board of Accounts would have any issue with it whatsoever. Has any other community that you've worked with had an issue? No. Or State Board of Accounts? I'll yield for now. Councilwoman Crossan. Yeah, uh, Mayor or one of the other gentlemen, if, if it's better answered by you, if um, the temporary loan is approved here tonight, will you immediately transfer that full amount into the pooled funds? No, don't need to. We'll just need to do it at the end of the month. Okay. It's so got to be in there before June 30th. And it will go to that account? And I, I want to state that even clearer. Um, we don't want the funds in there on June 30th because it's important that your June 30th fund balance does not appear to be overstated because the DLGF uses those June 30th balances when they begin to work the budget. Okay. Um, so it'll, it'll more technically be done on July 1st, the day that payment's due. We're going to get those funds in there and get them sent. Okay. That's what day of the week that is, I think. That's, yeah. That's right. It, I don't know if the first is on the weekend or not. We have to do it on the day before. It's got to be a business day. Sure. So I apologize. I may not get it. For the bank. It's but the bank has to be operating is what you're saying. End of the month. Okay. And, but those will go. And, and you're saying, just to use a figure, you're saying if what we need in there to, to supplement the property tax uh, disbursement for that purpose is $2 million, if that's how much money you're going to put in there. Yeah, I just pulled the number out of the air. Yeah, I know no, that's I know. not it. That's right. I mean, um, it's going to depend on what that tax draw is. But keep in mind, you actually loaned, you loaned that fund money last year in December. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get your June draw, you should, our recommendation is, when you get your June draw, you take as much of that money as possible and pay back that right. loan you've already made. So you're going to draw, your, after you're paying that loan back, your, your balance is going to be fairly minimal. We're, we're estimating roughly around $400,000. Mm -hmm. So we're anticipating, so in the resolution we mentioned we authorize the full amount, but we are anticipating that loan amount in, to be around $3.4 million. So it is, it is significant. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, will you report back to us at our first meeting in July of how much money, if this is approved tonight, how much money was put into that account? Yeah, we can do it after we do it if you'd like an email before that, that too. That would be yeah. excellent. Yep. Yeah. Sure if it, again, if it's approved. Um, I go. Councilman Elliott. Um, Mr. Rogers, I, I'd like for you to walk through with us the uh, two key strategies document that you gave us last week. Uh, Slowly, yeah. So we so we get it, yeah. Because uh, that that I think is uh, is important to the to the council. Sure. And Dean Rogers with Umball. Um Apologize, I wasn't here last week. But I think I had adequate adequate coverage with Paige being here. Um, you guys have made loans from the from wastewater to the sanitary bond fund in the past. What we want to do is formalize that process. And, and there's really two reasons why we want to formalize that process is because any, any outside support that you make to that bond fund, uh, you want to make sure you absolutely treat as a temporary loan. Um, and, and in order to do that, you need to do it in the form of a resolution. Because otherwise, as the mayor mentioned, the DLGF is viewing that as revenues and, and you're essentially penalizing yourself because of that. Um, but when it's a temporary loan, they'll work that into the budget and you'll be able to maximize your property tax levy. So, for instance, if you don't approve this resolution tonight, as the mayor mentioned, the bond payment will get made. We'll, we'll do what has happened in the past, but it's going to hurt you in the long run because we saw a dip in the, in the tax levy of the bond fund this year. And we'll continue to see that dip because the DLGF would view that as revenue coming in as opposed to a temporary loan, which is what it's truly meant to be. Um, the second point, uh, as far as um, 
making sure you maximize your property tax levy in that bond fund and, and over time can reduce this loan support that is needed is that you need to make sure you minimize um, the June 30th balance in that fund. And what I mean by that is let, it shouldn't be overstated because of, of support that it has received from other funds because that is the starting balance that the DLGF uses to evaluate that fund as part of the budget process. So to the extent that you've made loans to that fund, when you get your June tax draw, you should pay those back prior to the end of June so that that cash balance isn't artificially overstated because otherwise it, you get penalized through the budget process. Okay. So we do this to maximize the property tax levy of the sanitary bond fund. Correct. Okay. A given is we're going to make the bond payments. Right. Uh, a given is we need to avoid negative cash balances because the State Board of Accounts and DLGF don't like that. A given is the lowest cash balance we can present at June 30 works best going forward in Correct. the next year's budgeting process. Correct. So any money we move in to the sanitary bond fund we do not want to do it by transfers, which must be counted as revenue. We want to do it by formal loans so that it's not counted as revenue and it's recognized as an obligation repayable in the future by this fund. That is absolutely okay. correct. So this, this is money that's in the wastewater utility that's got to be used to make the, the bond payment. Uh, all we're doing is classifying it as a loan instead of as a as a transfer. We took the six million dollars band money from the county, and I believe three million went into this fund a few years ago to shore it up, and then three million went into the I believe it was the wastewater utility capital <coughs> improvement fund that was uh, that was uh, uh, underwater significantly with the idea that it would eventually be uh, repaid. Out of a out of a bond issue, that's why it's called a six million dollar bond anticipation note because we anticipated getting bonding for that. So it it it's a uh, uh, I just don't want the property tax levy. I want the property tax levy in in this fund to be as high as it can be, and I think the way we accomplish that is <laughs> the strategy you uh, you've uh, recommended. Now, you think the, the loan will be 3.4 and not 3.8? Correct. Okay. Um, with that, uh, you know, I believe I, I understand and I yield. Thank you. Councilman Azar, uh, just a clarification. You said you may not have to use the entire 3.4 or whatever, is that correct? 3.8. Or whatever you You may not have to use all of it. Now, does the DLGF use the figure you, that's authorized or the figure that you use? The figure that you use. So, so in fact, when Dennis first drew this resolution up, he had the anticipated amount in there, $3.4 million and change. And, and my comment to Dennis was, Dennis, let's let's authorize the full amount, and, here, and here's why. Let's say for some reason... I mean, we know last year, Earl, that when um, the tax payments came in, they were a little bit messed up. You got, you got in the sanitary, remember, you got a lot more in the first six months than you really technically should have, and that was corrected in the second six months. So let's cover our bases, and we don't know to the penny what you're going to get. So if, for instance, we put $3.4 in this resolution, and it turns out for some reason you needed 3.5. Uh, we would have shorted ourselves. So let's authorize the maximum amount, but we'll use only what is needed, and that's what the DLGF will consider as in, in their budget process. So basically we're just we're protecting ourselves right. in the future. Right. It's like a parameters, a parameters bond ordinance. Gotcha. Uh, you guys have seen that where you authorize up to a certain amount. It's, it's, that's all it is is an upper parameter. The expectation is always for it to be up below to that. Amount. Okay. Thank you. Are you? Councilman Garrison, one more thought. Uh, we, we talked last week we were going to roll this money over, but we wanted to, I think the comment was, pay back as much as possible by the end of the year. So we're going to be a little bit short by the end of the year. 
And so I guess my question is, what happens when we're short after the first time, and then the next time we may be short again, and as the shortness continues, how do we make that shortness up? I may not answer your question here. Assuming but me... that, that that trend would continue, that we don't have enough. I just for a little more color, since you weren't here, what we were talking about was that we'll actually have to come back to the council later this year because we know the full amount of this loan won't be repaid. So we'll have to get an extension to the final June. An extension of six months, I think, yeah. is what we talked about. Yeah. So, um, so the first six months, we know, we can anticipate we're going to be short. Fair question. Um, we have put together uh, five years worth of monthly cash flows to see what this would look like. And I don't know if Paige shared this last week, but where we're at with that is that we anticipate you're going to have a little bit of a bubble in January of 19 because you are going to need some additional loan money. Um, but once you reach that point, that outstanding loan balance will decrease over time. And what we anticipate is that in June, when you get your June uh, tax draw starting in 2020, that that loan balance will be able to go down to zero. And, and at that point in time, it truly becomes that revolving loan where you're, you're loaning the money out. And by June of every year, when you get your tax draw, you should be able to fully repay that. So we don't expect it to be a building balance like, like it's an estimate you're asking about. Worst, give me a worst case scenario. What if, we, what if we can't pay that back? What funds or where can we get funds to pay that back? Can we, if there's a future rate increase, can that money be redirected to repay that? Or is this only property tax money? Um, so to repay the loan, yeah, it's, it's, it's property tax dollars that are going to repay it. But I guess keep in mind that this is all the same, same sorts of projects we're paying for here um, that are, you know, long-term control plan related. It just so happens some of them are tax supported, some of them are rate supported. You know, some money's coming out of the right pocket, some of it's coming out of the left, but it's all for, uh, you know, your same customer base and same type of projects. Um, so I don't, so I'm can, not you sure. use, can you use rate money, rate revenue? To repay this, if we fall behind, we want to catch it up. To repay the bonds, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's essentially kind of what we're talking about here: is, is temporary loaning that rate money to 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 be able to make that bond payment. So it's coming from that same those rates, but in the past we didn't pay it back; we just kept it, made the bond payment. In this case, you loan it over there, you pay it back, and you pay some of it back. It's still coming out of that same the funds that are used for these projects. So it's the same money. You wouldn't really be paying back. You know, you pay back what you can out of property tax dollars. So you're giving the, the wastewater side some money back, but we would have been using the wastewater money to make up the difference if we didn't do the loan. So the bottom line never changes. Mm -hmm. We're making bond payment of this amount, and part of it comes from here. The other rest of it comes from here. We're just going to pay that back. So that's a good thing, really, at the end of the day. I mean, we're going to be paying some of it back in, what you said, 20 what? 2020? Mm -hmm. So then we're only, we're never in the rear. We're just paying six months' worth, we pay it all back. Then we got to turn around and do it again. Thank you. Thank you. President, if there's no further uh, discussion, I uh, move we approve Resolution 9, 2018, unless we need to agree to vote first. That was introduced. Okay. With that, then I'll restate. Uh, I move we approve Resolution 9, 2018. Second. Roll call. Okay, it has been moved by Councilman Elliott and seconded by Councilman Azar that we approve Resolution 9, 2018. Roll call, please. Councilperson Aller. Yes. Councilperson Azar. Yes. Councilperson Crossan. No. Councilperson Elliott. Yes. Councilperson Garrison. No. Councilperson Morris. Yes. Councilperson Nation. No. Councilperson Nasser. No. Councilperson Devon. Yes. That's five yes for now. All right. Thank you.
Next item, please. We have tax abatement forms that were not filed. They are for DABC Sony. Um, I believe Mr. Felling would like to make a statement. I would request uh, that whatever action is taken on these, uh, if the council does not have an issue, we address them all at the same time, uh, regardless. Whatever action is taken should apply to all of them. So you would have to make a motion on each individual one. I could read the, uh, the resolution numbers quickly if you'd like. Yeah, I think that's probably the resolution 12 2010, which is a real property abatement, resolution 13 2010, which is a personal property abatement, resolution 3 2008, which is a personal property abatement, resolution 4 2008, which is a real property abatement, resolution 6 2007, which is a personal property abatement, resolution 6 2011, which is a personal property abatement, resolution 7 2009, which is a real property abatement, and resolution 8 2009, which is a personal property abatement. I did not receive any CF1 forms. Councilman the nomination. Do we have to ask for public comment first? Do we have to do public comment on this? Right. Okay. <laughs> I, I will ask if anybody <laughs> from the public would like to speak on these, please feel free to come on up. Again, keeping my with my questions about uh, clarity. I know, and it's not. Anybody that doesn't know that day you see is days are numbered. They've already cut their staff down. Uh, you go by the place, there's only one building that still shows people working in it, and that's going to go away soon. So going back over, uh, and this you don't have an idea, but I was wondering if it uh, can be uh, looked up by this council. You know, I tell the public, but I wish you guys would look it up. Starting when they opened up, how many reimbatements did we give all the way through to now with the idea of helping them get set up, get their business going, and uh, how much abatement, in other words, property tax cuts did we give them over that time they were there? Do you, and uh, just... I would you would find out so that you would know and ask yourself this when we give these reimbates to some of these businesses and they they pay us back by moving the plant somewhere else where they can get cheaper product made or they literally quit. You know, they basically DIDC basically is what the whole nation's got a problem with. We're making these businesses too big. They're too consolidated. They control too much of the market. And then when the market, uh, when they get done and they're not making enough profit, they just fold up their tent and the heck with everybody. How much did we lose from uh, property taxes that we should have got or business taxes we should have got in this community? Did we give up for them to just pack up and leave? I think it's a fair question. And again, I'm not making this a judgment, wrong, right, or anything. I think you nine people ought to ask the history, and that way the next time some of these businesses offer this, it's something to think about before you just automatically give them their tax abatements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Crossan. Yes, I just had a question for probably for Michelle and, or um, uh, Eddie, um, have we had any communication from them on this? Uh, I'll give uh, previous years as examples. They contact the Harrison Township Assessor's Office and ask for an extension. And uh, then I usually contact the Harrison Township Assessor and say, have they had an extension? Um, I have not received any communication okay. on that. But usually they're given a 30 days extension which would put it to tomorrow mm -hmm. we have a little bit of a gray area because may 15th is the filing deadline and typically you have 45 days to take action and that's the gray area of mm -hmm. if they don't file a form do you have 45 days and it, we wouldn't have enough time to go to our july meetings yeah again you, you can cancel a hearing Councilman Nation. Um, 
This is, again, a question for counsel or uh, Michelle. Uh, since we don't have CF1 forms from them, uh, we don't really have any data in front of us to make a determination about whether they are in substantial compliance or not. Um, is the absence of a CF1 form, does that constitute non-compliance? In fact, non-compliance. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The burden's on them to prove that they're in compliance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if there is no further discussion, I move that we find DADC, DADC Sony uh, not in compliance for all of these tax abatements, and we take the next step, which is setting a hearing to bring their representative in to tell us why they're not able to meet their obligations. Second. Second. It has been moved by Councilman Nason, seconded by Councilwoman Crossan, that uh, we find uh, RS 12, 2010, RS 13, 2010, RS 3, 2008, RS 4, 2008, RS 6, 2007, RS 6, 2011, RS 7, 2009, and RS 8, 2009, not in substantial compliance. All those in favor of that say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, they have been found to not be in substantial compliance. Mr. President, yes. uh, you should go ahead and set the hearing for that. Okay. Um, could we do that at the same time as yes. the previous? Okay. And that is on um, July 12th. At 5.30. Okay. You will we'll need a motion in a second. Mr. President. Customization. I move that we set the hearing for DADC Sony's uh, compliance on uh, February, I'm sorry, okay. July the 12th <laughs> at 5.30 p.m. Second. He has been moved by Councilman Nation, seconded by Councilman Nasser, that uh, we have Sony DADC in for a hearing on July 12th at 5.30 for uh, uh, non-compliance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that hearing is set. Next item, please. Uh, McAllister Brothers, RS 11 2008, uh, review of the compliance form that was filed today. You should have a copy before you. They are showing um, 18 employees and they estimated they would have 12. Michelle, is that paperwork with the, uh, this, I, I don't see that in my packet. I didn't see it with the others. I apologize. Um, there was a lot of forms. We might have missed this one. We can make a copy real quick. And I'm not the only one, right? No. Okay. No. no. So what's the summary? Uh, employees went from 12 to 18. Uh, what about salaries? The numbers are, there are more uh, jobs and there are higher salaries than estimated. Okay. Well, based on that, can I go ahead and make a motion, Mr. President? Well, wait a minute. What was that, Michelle? I was just going to point something out uh, uh, just for everyone to look at. The uh, abatement was from 2008, but the completion date was 2012. So that was a four-year delay for it to be applied. But we don't know for sure if the abatement was applied partially that. Yeah, I thought opinion. they would probably be getting close to the end of theirs. But if it started, it started four years late. They're showing the completion date four years later. Which is something that we've seen, you know, in other ones we've discussed today, right? I mean, there's right. some that are taking years to complete. Okay, based on that, Mr. President, I move that RS 11 2008 be found as in compliance, in substantial compliance. Second. All right, it has been moved by Councilman Garrison and seconded by Councilman Nation that we find Resolution 11 2008 <laughs> in substantial compliance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is in compliance. Anything else, Michelle? Aye. Then I move to adjourn.
Second. It has been moved to adjourn by Council Nazar, seconded by Councilwoman Aller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.